I first like to thank organizers for inviting me here. It has been a great pleasure. This is actually my very first trip to Singapore, although it's not so far away from China. Uh, I want to start by saying a few words about uh, my career uh, with, uh, with, with Neil Garrett. This is how my career in astrophysics uh, started. In 1992, when I finished my postdoc in particle physics, I decided somehow to go back to, to astrophysics. So I applied a position, a fellowship position with Neil Garrett. Uh, Neil was happy for that. And then in the end, I asked him two questions. The first one was that I said, I left uh, astrophysics for three years after my PhD. Now, can I still uh, come back to astrophysics uh, in gamma ray uh, astronomy? He said, fine, it's no problem. Over the past few years, the gamma, ray, uh, the gamma ray astronomy hasn't moved that far, so you can come back. Uh, that was in 92, but today it may not be the case. And then my second question is that I like to work on the data. Can you offer me data for me to work on with you? He said, no. He, said, uh, I, uh, he was the project scientist of uh, CGRO, but he said, however, I don't have data. Good data are in Huntsville, go there. So I decided to apply to Huntsville uh, to, the, uh, the, to the BASI team. So that's how I started my uh, career again in astrophysics. Uh, this is uh, why today I can make my, my presentation. Uh, of course, over the years, I had many interactions with Neil Garros uh, in my Huntsville time. And also after I uh, came back to, to China, Neil Garros continued uh, to help us quite tremendously. Also for Chinese space astronomy, and then he uh, gave us a lot of help. Actually, just a few months before he passed away, he attended a meeting on, on the small mission, I'm going to talk a little bit later. On the China France uh, joined the small mission on Gamma Burst, uh, he attended that, meet, that meeting. He was telling us the lessons he learned from uh, SWIFT is that how you guys can have a, a mission to avoid uh, some of the problems we run into. So it was uh, really a great man. Okay, so I, I will talk about the Inside HX. HXMT is China's first actual astronomy satellite. And uh, uh, this is the satellite. We had the almost last view with the satellite before it was uh, put into the, into, uh, onto the rocket, uh, HXMT. So that's the team. So we got together in front of the satellite. And we have an English name called Insight. After it was launched, we renamed the satellite as Insight. <laughs> a little bit history on the mission. It has a very, very long history, it actually. In the, in the 1970s to 1980s, uh, people in the in Institute of High Energy Physics uh, decided to do X-ray astronomy. And at the time, it was not possible to launch a satellite. Uh, from China to do science, so they decided to develop a Bloom program. It was actually developed. Uh, the, the program was developed for this purpose. And they, uh, I, actually, I joined the program in 1984 <laughs> after I got my bachelor degree. And then in a few years, they uh, got a quite, uh, quite a good program. And they, uh, wrote, they wrote a proposal in 1994, actually 1993 in the beginning. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, proposal to do this mission. After many, many years of struggle, you can see, only in 2011, it was finally selected and funded. Uh, and it, over the, all these years, Professor T.B. Lee uh, was the leader for this program. He proposed this and then led the program all the way uh, to uh, to almost before the launch, uh, the 2016, that's when he decided to step down that I took over as the PI of the mission. And it was uh, renamed as uh, uh, Hui Yan here, inside to honor uh, my other uh, advisor, Professor TVD was my uh, uh, supervisor when I was doing uh, a master degree study there, and the Professor He was my other advisor. And uh, the name here came from uh, her. 
and she was the founder of the field in China. So she uh, actually passed away in the same year the mission was selected. So she left her eye with us. Now her eye is flying in the sky. And eventually, June 15 last year, it was launched successfully in China. So it has been working ever since. So I want to go through this mission very quickly. And uh, first on the core sciences of the mission, and we'll spend a lot of time doing galactic plane scan survey and monitor, and uh, obviously to study the transient universe uh, in, the, in, the, in the Milky Way. And we'll do pointed observations uh, of many actual binary. So far we have done a lot. And of course with multi-wavelength observations, and the gummy birds, that was a new surprise. It's near the end of uh, we built the satellite. Actually, everything was put onto the, uh, onto the satellite. I discovered that we can actually use uh, the instrument to observe gummy birds. And so far, we have done a lot of that. So that's what we have on the satellite. We have a three set of instruments starting from low energy. Uh, 1 to 15 keV is kind of a CCD. It's a, it's, a, it's a large array of CCD, but without a telescope, so it's collimated. And going to medium energy, 5 to 30 keV, almost 1,000 square centimeters here, it's silicon. And then we have a large array of what we call the high energy instrument uh, made of uh, scintillators. Normally, it covers energy range 20 to 250 keV. Uh, but we can extend the energy range all the way to 3 MeV to observe gummy bursts. I will show you uh, very soon. So that's the effective area of the three set of instruments. I want to remind you again, we don't have telescope. Okay? So we have a collimated instrument there. And this is if you want uh, to compare with HXMT with other actual missions. I put all the numbers here. But the main point is that uh, we have a fairly large effective area over this energy band, 1 to uh, kind of 250 keV in a pointed mode. And we can actually go all the way to 3,000 keV uh, if we use it as an off-scan monitor mode. Right? And we don't have a telescope, but we have a collimator to, rest to restrict our field of view. We have a different set of uh, collimators. You can see here their orientation are here. And also we have some larger field of view uh, instrument. It's uh, the kind of uh, also can be used as a uh, sky wide field monitor, but not for all sky. And uh, we before, uh, one year before the launch, we uh, made a call for proposals for observations. And based on that, we made a one-year observational plan. Uh, here, I just want to use it to show you which kind of observation we do. And these, uh, these blue ones, uh, these green ones, are the Milky Way, essentially. So it shows you we are going to spend a lot of time to do the scanning observation of the whole Milky Way. And then these blue ones, these ones are the regular target, means they are normally bright. So we all have a regular scheduled observation. Then it's red uh, sources that target are the transient. Uh, this, so it will be TO observation. Uh, so far, we are spending roughly about one third here, one third on the TO, the one third on regular observation. It's not by any particular purpose. It just turned out to be that way. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, kind of observation we do. Uh, let me see if I can show you how we do the galactic plane uh, scan. Let's say this should be a, a small video here. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, it works. Uh, this is for a single 20 by 20 degree. It takes about three hours to finish one region. Then it move on to another sky region. So uh, one by one, of course, the, uh, the, the normal observational sequence is not like this. It depends on solar angle and things like that. Uh, but the bottom line is that we plan uh, to scan over the galactic plane and over one year. So that will be the kind of exposure we do. As you can see, uh, we will spend more time in the center of the Milky Way than other places. 
And uh, this is uh, uh, up to the end of November. That's the exposure map we have. Uh, from the real data, we find out uh, uh, the, the kind of sensitivity we have is about a five milligram for each single scan, about three hours. That's the kind of sensitivity we have. Of course, if we use more data, we can go to deeper sensitivity. So that's the kind of thing we have. And we have found some new source candidate, but so far we have not been able to confirm those. Uh, this is one of those, for example, here. It's uh, quite bright. It's not in the in our catalog. So this is uh, something we are, we are working on. Uh, this is for the galactic center region. Uh, of course, it's a larger field of your 20 by 20 degree. This is for this one scan. As you can see here, we reconstructed quite a number of sources there. This is the light curve data. And red uh, shows you that's where the, so when the source was scanned through, you see the increase of the country. So, to, so that's the, the most crowded region, of course, for us. Uh, this is one example for the for uh, for a pulsar wind nebula. You can see here that's real data. Uh, that's the collimator response. And uh, we uh, initially uh, the student thought he found a new source because he started with the Maxi catalog, but the source is not in the Maxi uh, catalog. It turns out it's a super not this uh, this extended source, so typically not in the Maxi catalog. Uh, we are seeing quite a few of the, and also supernova remnant, so things like that. Okay. And of course, when we scan over the same region again and again, we will monitor uh, the, uh, the source variability. There's one example here. There's one source, uh, GX3 plus 1, it's a neutron star actually binary. Uh, it's, uh, you can see that uh, the, the flux varies, so we can uh, be used as a monitor for the non-sources in the, in, the, in the Milky Way. And uh, uh, one major uh, scientific goal is to uh, measure the cyclotron, try to detect the cyclotron absorption line from neutron stars uh, in order to measure uh, the magnetic field of neutron stars uh, sort of in a, in a direct way. Uh, that's what we uh, we have done a few of those. For example, this uh, uh, this high mass actual binaries have non cyclotron lines, and we uh, confirm those. And uh, actually, see some interesting variations of the line energy as a function of time. Uh, so, so this was in the pulsed spectra. Uh, one uh, one nice surprise is from this one. From this GRO source is a high mass actual binary. And uh, previously was uh, tentatively observed at about the four sigma level by New Star and Struggle. And we also observed the source of the, during the recent outburst. Uh, in, we have uh, 17 modules in the high energy instrument. Uh, in one module, actually, you can already see uh, the feature very clearly. And if we combine all the 17 modules with this about 200, a kilosecond observation, we got uh, about 20 sigma detection. I mean, this is uh, so far the, the highest energy uh, cyclotron line among any neutron stars known. So this is quite an uh, uh, interesting result. And uh, it's because we have this broad energy range and it's large effective area, so we can manage to, to detect this line. And actually, to the extent that we can do the phase resolve, uh, cyclotron line, this, uh, the optical depth as a function of the, uh, of the spinning of the neutron star, the spinning phase of the neutron star. We are also monitoring some new sources, for example, for example this one is a swift uh, new pulsar. Uh, this is the bad light curve, this is our monitoring, the light curve here. And the source is so bright that uh, we can see uh, the pulse fro the pulse profile evolution very clearly. You can see as a function of time. This is, for example, for three uh, episodes separated by about 10 days, you can see the pulse profile evolved quite significantly. So we can do this kind of thing. 
And for millisecond pulsars, we are also observing, uh, so far we de detected three of them. Uh, this is a crab, of course, is of a calibration sort. We are observing crab whenever we could possibly do. And this is for a maxi black hole candidate. It's a maxi light curve. We have uh, made quite a few observations. And uh, we detected this kind of uh, type C and type B QPOs, a kind of uh, uh, oscillation in the equation in the equation disk around uh, around the black hole. Uh, so this kind of uh, uh, this uh, hardness intensity variation typical of a black hole uh, actually binary. Uh, this, for example, the the power density spectra in all the three instruments, you can see in the three energy band in all of this. And the, because of this, we can study, for example, the QPO frequency as a function of energy, not obvious evolution, uh, but the RMS fraction of the QPO as a function of energy, we can see this very clearly okay, over uh, to the high energy. And previously was kind of implication this might happen, but now we have uh, uh, this very firm detection. As you can see here, it's a power density spectral. We see this very clearly. We can study coherence and the lag and so on. And now I move on to gummy burst uh, on this. It was not designed to observe gummy burst at all. And only later on, we, we found that uh, this, uh, this, this high energy instrument it's made of two layers. There's a sodium iodide, very thin, as you can see here. Cesium iodide is very thick. So this, in principle, can, inter can intercept the gamma ray photon up to very high energy. But we have to adjust our photon multipliers a little bit in order to see the signal very well. So that's what we are doing uh, so far. Uh, for the, the when we do the regular observation, we point to the source, so we only receive photons through the collimator. Right? But however, the gamma ray photon above 200 keV can penetrate the satellite, right? and also the shielding material to interact here. Then we can uh, detect on this uh, the, the original design as the background rejection detector. Uh, now we use this as uh, as a gamma burst monitor. And the way to do that is to lower the, the high voltage on the, on the photomultiplier so that for this detector, if we didn't do anything, then the energy range will be something like 40 to 600 kV. It's OK. We can still see gamma burst there. But remember that any photon below 200 kV will not penetrate. So you have a narrow energy band. If we lower the, photo, the high voltage a little bit, then the energy range will be broadened uh, to, from 200 keV to 3 MeV. Uh, now suddenly we have an MeV gamma ray burst monitor. And this will allow us to measure the E-peak energy of the gamma ray burst, obviously. So I will show you uh, some uh, simulation here. Uh, depending on the incident angle, uh, so the, the shielding material and the satellite blockage will be different. So we have. Uh, for different incident angle, we have a different effective area as a function of, of energy. But anyway, on the average, it will be something uh, between 1,000 to 2,000 square centimeters, between 200 keV and a few MeV. So in this energy band, we suddenly become the largest gamma ray burst monitor in this MeV energy range. So this is the largest MeV GRB monitor. Uh, ever flown. It's not by purpose, it just turns out uh, to be like that. And because we have 18 different, de we have 18 detectors, uh, then the, for different direction, that will cast different shadows uh, of the satellite material. Uh, you can actually localize the coming burst uh, with the, uh, no, not, not with a great accuracy, just with a few degrees. But in principle, that's something that can be done. And you can also measure the spectral, so things like that. A few examples here. Uh, this this actually the very first uh, gamma burst we detected. We were launched on um, uh, on June 15. We the the instrument was turned on the June 21st or something. Okay, so a few days later we started to see gamma burst. Uh, the, this is the first one. This as you see this one 
it's very bright. We have a lot of photons. So far, I think we detected something like a 50 uh, gamma burst. Uh, it's uh, the high significance. Uh, that's uh, showed a lot of uh, fainter one we are working on. Also, we, th this is a very short gamma burst you can see here. It's just a few seconds. This uh, is a 0.2 seconds. So we can detect the long and short gamma burst. And in particular, for short and hard gamma burst, we are particularly sensitive. Uh, this is one example. Uh, this particular gamma burst, and uh, th this is for, for us. It's, uh, the, uh, it triggered the automatic search program uh, with 12 sigma. Uh, we, then we went to the GBM data. Uh, we find uh, this about 8 sigma uh, spike there. Then we went to the integral data, and uh, this is about 4 sigma there. So you can see for some uh, set of gummy bird, if it is hard, then uh, inside can have a better detection for hard gummy birds. Uh, for the soft ones, we are very bad because of the satellite shielding material stop all the soft photon. So we are only sensitive to the hard gummy birds. Okay? And um, we also joined IPN. Uh, after a few tests, uh, they decided that we can do that because the timing uh, is, uh, is quite good. As you can see here for this particular gummy burst, that with the inside data, we can narrow down uh, its uh, localization. Uh, somewhat compared with others. So it, it really depends on from which direction gamma burst comes. So sometimes we can actually make some contribution to the localization of the gamma burst uh, this way. Uh, now on the gravitational wave uh, event, this double neutron star merger event, uh, we participated in this, although we didn't see anything. We didn't see any photons because it's essentially no photons about 200 keV, and we only start from 200 keV. So we didn't see anything, but, uh, but nevertheless, we made uh, quite a stringent upper limit uh, on between 200 keV and 5 MeV on any gamma ray emission from this double neutron star merger. And we published it over paper at the cover, uh, at the cover paper on, the, on, on this journal. And we also, of course, joined this uh, multi-messenger uh, paper. Uh, that's our team here. And uh, in, the, uh, in order to have an upper limit, we have to calibrate our instrument. And remember that uh, uh, that happened on uh, August 17, on the two months after uh, INSIGHT was launched, that we have not fully calibrated our instrument yet. In, in fact, we still have not done that. So in order to do that, we decided to use a crab to do a calibration. We made a calibration observation. That is, we put crab in the same incident direction as this event, uh, so that it comes from the same direction, and we observed the pulse profile of a crab. Assuming what we know uh, what a crab looks like in this energy range, then we use the crab to infer the upper limit for that particular uh, gummy burst, that GBM gummy burst, uh, what we did. I just mentioned uh, very briefly that we are observing crab every day, essentially, because of this. Okay? So we are monitoring crab every day. So every day we can have a profile of a crab in the MEV energy range. So we are doing crab monitoring uh, all, all the time. And that's what happened on that day. Uh, that's when GBM trigger, gravitational wave trigger, as you can see in our light curve, it's really nothing significant. And well, the source was not blocked by the Earth. So we are observing it, but we didn't see anything. So therefore, we have three upper, three sigma upper limit for the precursor uh, during the gamma ray burst and, uh, and after gamma ray burst. So we have some uh, uh, upper limit there. It may or may not be useful for uh, any models. So I uh, do a summary for uh, Insight HXMT. Then I will give a short talk on something else that you might be more interested in. Yeah. So this is China's first X-ray astronomy satellite. And they, it had the three instruments covering the three energy range. And the, the high energy instrument can be extended to this energy range as an OSCAR monitor. In fact, in fact, we are using it for OSCAR monitor. Uh, we have uh, finished the, the in-orbit, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, test and the calibration phase. Uh, we spent about, uh, what, 
one third of the time in, in the galactic plane scan survey and observed many bright sources, black or neutron stars. And we have done many TOOs actually so far. It was designed not with um, many TOOs, but so far we are doing TOOs all the time. And actually over most of the good results actually come from a TOO. There's something we learned from Neil Garrett. These TOOs are very useful. So we decided to do that as frequent as possible. Uh, we have uh, detected many gamma bursts. And we have uh, started a regular science operation and uh, designed to go with it for six plus years. There's no consumer on board, just like uh, any other satellite you know, those days. So if everything works well, uh, more than 10 years is, uh, is entirely possible. So if you are interested in using the data or using the satellite to do observation, there are several ways to do that. And of course, the first one is that those, those guys who collaborated with us in the past. And also, um, we have quite a few uh, helpers who helped us to do multi-wavelength observations. Then we join us to write papers. And also, we have uh, some collaborators who said, we ju I just want to analyze your data. So I have a scientific idea, I just want to do that. It's also OK. So you can also join our team to do that. So for all the information about the mission, you can, you can find it here if you are, you are interested. Uh, we don't have a very good English website, but some basic information should be available there. So I will move on to my uh, second talk very quickly. Uh, because I was asked about uh, China the future mission, so I will give a, a very quick, uh, very brief introduction uh, to uh, several. Yeah? Uh, you said that you can uh, change the configuration. How to do that? Uh, you mean the, the, the high energy part? Is yeah, yeah. We just uh, use the instruction to lower the high voltage. So that can be done quite easily. Yeah. So it's a part of the, uh, the, that part of operation. OK, so uh, I will show you, uh, give you a very brief introduction to China's near future space high energy electrophysics mission. Actually, quite a few, as I will show you. The sky will be quite crowded by our satellite over the next few years. The first one will be a small, uh, a dedicated uh, mission for gravitational wave high energy electromagnetic counterpart or sky monitor called the GCAM. The idea is that to launch two satellites, small satellites, each one covers more than half of the sky, so uh, orbiting the Earth on the opposite side. So therefore, the goal is that we have 100% uh, sky coverage 100% of the time. So the full-time full sky coverage for any transient event between 6 keV and M and 5 MeV with a fluence something like uh, brighter uh, than uh, this will be 100 milligram or something like that. Okay. So we have also some uh, localization, one one degree localization. So that's the idea. So this has been selected. We hope to uh, just been selected. We are, we are building this one at the speed of light. Okay. So <laughs> the goal is to launch this before 2020. The idea is to catch uh, the next uh, good sensitivity of, uh, of LIGO and Virgo, when we expect to have many triggers from, uh, from a gravitational wave. So try to maximize the scientific return of LIGO and Virgo with a full sky coverage all the time. We are not going to miss anyone after that. And it, the sensitive, in terms of sensitivity, I think it's comparable to GBM, maybe slightly more sensitive because we go to a slightly lower energy, so slightly more sensitive than, than GBM. Okay? So that's the, the first one. And the second one, you already heard, I think, on the first day, the SWARM, a China-France mission on gamma burst, as you can see here. Uh, France is responsible for this uh, eclairs, the gamma burst imager and the trigger, and also follow up X-ray telescope there. Uh, in China, we are responsible for gamma burst monitors. This is a broadband. This goes to the third from 30 kV to M, 5 MeV. 
we are not thinking how to lower the, the threshold slightly. And also we have a, a visible telescope on board, as you can see here. So we have an optical telescope. So we have a, a gamma ray, gamma ray, x-ray, and optical. Then on the ground, uh, we have some uh, follow-up telescope dedicated to, to this mission. And the PI is the Professor Wei from NOAC. He was supposed to come, but for whatever reason, he didn't come. So he was the PI of the mission. I'm a co-PI of the mission. So we work together on this one. I think it's more or less on track for this launch, 221, more or less on track. Uh, then Einstein probe, you already heard quite a few times uh, during this meeting. Uh, the, uh, the bottom line is that it's made of a very ambitious uh, uh, old sky monitor. It focuses using lobster eye optics to cover uh, 3,600 square degree of sky and single shot with a very high sensitivity. This will be uh, the, the wide field uh, actually monitor with the highest sensitivity. Then it has a follow-up actually telescope in the middle here is actually telescope, of course it's a star sensor. So that's basically what that is. It has been selected, uh, selected last year, the launch is 222. So 220, two small satellite, 221, swarm 222, this one. So every year we're going to have something. PI is Professor Wei Mingyuan from NOAC. The third one is, uh, is a large observatory called actually timing and polarization that initially what that is. Initially, the goal is to study black hole and neutron stars and with a very large collective area and also a polarization measurement capability. And over the past few years, we have worked with the European team, the LOFT team. So we merged with the LOFT team uh, with their uh, large area detectors. So that's this in the center of the satellite is original XTP. Now these are the loft winds, okay, loft LED detector and the loft wide field monitors. So this is the, uh, it's going to be a quite powerful uh, observatory. It also has a quite a long, uh, long, long history. It was proposed more than 10 years ago. We had a phase zero study, phase A study, we are just starting now a phase A plus study. Then the phase B will be next year. Uh, then, uh, then we'll move on to phase C and D. So the launch time is 225. So uh, also we have to work on this at the speed of light. We are fairly short of time. But that's what we, we plan to do there. Uh, we have uh, mostly European collaborators and the coordinator in Europe is Marco Ferrosi, uh, the, pre the former PI of LOFT. Now he's our European uh, coordinator. We also have an international coordinator, Andrea Santangelo from Tübingen University there. And the last one I'm going to tell you, this is a high energy cosmic ray detector called HERD. This will be a large experiment on China's space station. Okay. And uh, they, they, to make this a flagship and a landmark scientific experiment there. Uh, they, it has several goals. The, it's, uh, the most important one is the indirect dark matter search uh, by detecting the spectra of uh, electrons uh, to a very broad energy range uh, with very high energy uh, resolution. And also going to have a precise cosmic ray spectrum measurement and also composition measurement. And it's also a gamma ray monitor, uh, the wide field gamma ray monitor uh, kind of uh, the capability of uh, uh, of lead on, uh, on the, on the, in, in the sky right now. And the, the unique capability this one will have is that it has a direct PEV cosmic ray observation with a very good energy resolution, with a low energy gamma ray observation, hundreds of MEV, uh, what we intended to, to have. And uh, then we all have a larger the geometric factor for electron and the cosmic ray. Uh, the planned launch is also 225. And that's what we are going to have on China Space Station. It's at, at this location here. In the center is the 3D colorimeter. Uh, <laughs> uh, the 3D means from any direction we can reconstruct the shower. Then it's surrounded 
by the silicon tracker from all five sides, and plastic scintillator, and the things like that. So, so I'm a PI of the mission. We have also a European coordinator, Giovanni Ambrosi from INF in Italy. So I have a summary on the, on the future program of China. And 2020, we are going to launch GCAM. It's a two, two small satellites orbiting on the opposite side of the Earth. And 2021, Swarm will be launched. This multi-wavelength uh, small observatory is supposed to be a SWIFT follow-on mission. 2022 is the Einstein probe. I call this the most sensitive wide field of view actually monitor with the uh, uh, follow-up actually telescope. Then 2025, we have EACTP. This will be the first uh, uh, space observatory with a simultaneous actually timing, spectroscopy, and the polarimetry observation uh, simultaneously. It has uh, all this kind of capability. Then 2025, I put a question mark here because it's not been finally selective, and we are still working on. So this will be first the high energy 3D calorimeter with five side acceptance. So this will be very few for those people here interested. This will be very wide field gamma ray or sky monitor. It monitors basically half of the sky for, for, for gamma ray. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks for keeping to the time um, for this beautiful presentation. Thank you. Looks like a daunting yeah. space program. It's wonderful. So, questions? Uh, uh, can I can I ask uh, a question? Uh, maybe maybe I missed it. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a, a little bit about s uh, angular accuracy uh, of gamma ray bursts or transient yeah. uh, detection with HXMT and Swarm, yeah. and maybe also timing. You said there's yeah. hours. You said about HXMT, there's yeah. hours. Yeah. So can, can, you, can you expand a little bit? For inside HXMT, for gamma burst, we don't have a good localization capability because we rely on the shadow of the satellite. So uh, we did simulation. It's uh, several degrees. Typically, so it's worse than GBM, but comparable in that range. Uh, we have not been able to realize that yet because the calibration has not been finished. We did not calibrate the whole satellite, right? So to do that, you really have the, mo the only way to do that is that either you model the satellite, which is not practical, or we are using CRAB actually to calibrate the satellite to calibrate the detector, because we are detecting crap every day from all different directions. We are c accumulating this data together. Eventually, we will have uh, uh, calibrated the instrument for the gamma burst. Okay. Right. But for the pointed observations through the aperture, of course, that is calibrated. So only for this is not. So we anticipate a few degrees, I think, eventually. Not, not yet. Then for other mission, for swarm, of, of course, uh, the e clairs is an imager, right. it's an imager. So automatically have the uh, Archimedes, a few Archimedes, 10 Archimedes, I believe, the angular resolution for swarm, for gamma burst. Then we have actually follow up telescope that will narrow down this to down to like uh, arc second. They have a VT, so similar to, to SWIFT. And, and reaction to alert times. Yeah, uh, it will be real time. It will be very, real. Very yeah, yeah. Uh, on, they will onboard trigger and uh, reorientation onboard. Uh, not as quick as Swift, uh, because the satellite platform cannot respond within second. Take the I think the design goal is a five minutes. Okay. So within five minutes to to to, to repoint and to be stabilized to the to the target in five That's minutes. Good. That's good, very good. Please, John. So I had a question. Uh, uh, and either I missed it or it went by a little fast. On the, it's true on some of these, but on the uh, Einstein probe, yeah. it didn't look like you had coded mass aperture. No, we how, didn't. How, we, how, we, do you, how do you get the position for the follow up telescope? I mean, it, it just look wide field of view. This is uh, lobster eye optics, it is the focusing optics just a very wide field of view. 
Okay, so this is just uh, it's it's like it's like a lot of actually telescope. All right, so it's just it's just it is the optic. So we, uh, I think the angle of resolution here through the optic is uh, four arc minutes. We we'll get down to about uh, four arc minute position from here. Then the actual telescope with the thirty arc minute field of view will follow this. So it will be first be localized here, then will be followed by with this actual telescope. So that's what we we will do. It's not coded mask. It's just the focusing optics. Okay. Yeah. So your existing satellite is a quasi. You know, coated mask. <laughs> right. Uh, this will be the new kind of optics. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it has been uh, flown on, uh, on, uh, on rocket so far. It will be flown on, uh, on Baby, uh, Baby Columbus mission. There will be a, a telescope like that, but with a smaller, smaller version. This will be the largest one, which is a wide. Yeah. Yeah, this this little thing here. See, this actually each one is a telescope. <laughs> so each tube is a telescope. Just a lot of telescope there. Yes. So more questions for Shannon. Yeah, Krisa. Yes, Krisa. Uh, Sorry. This might be just a futile question, but I was wondering, since there is so much opportunity for collaboration internationally. And in the United States as well, uh, is there any plans or any ideas or any possibility for that matter, for the Chinese Space Agency to coordinate with NASA for proposals okay. for collaborations? Um, yeah, for obviously uh, it, it, we're all aware of the international uh, environment right yeah, now. Yeah. But uh, I was wondering if you guys have even thought about it. Uh, China has been uh, talking with Europe, with the ESA all the time on the, on, on all of this, right? in particular space station and China space station. The ESA has shown uh, great interest uh, in the, both on the scientific experiment actually to build something on China space station. So with, uh, with, with the ESA, uh, there's very active discussion going on. Uh, with NASA, it's no discussion. Yes, going uh, on. bilateral collaboration yeah. is not allowed by right, law, but right. I was wondering yeah. international. Yeah, I think uh, through ESA, right, since we are talking with the ESA, so if you find uh, uh, interesting partners in ESA in Europe, then we work together. Uh, China has uh, no particular policy uh, toward either Europe or, or the or US, it's just the US policy. You as a politic, yeah. So it's not okay. even a policy; it's a law. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So, any else? If there are more, no more uh, issues, questions, uh, we thank uh, Shannon again. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alina. Thank you.